Hello, this is Jim Schaefer, executive producer and host of Rip Rap, the academic book television program. My guest is Randy Beyer, and we'll be discussing the latest books that Rip Rap has received, including those on providing public services in Asia, difficulties in breathing in our allergy-rich environment, plus others on energy efficiency and painting. Welcome to Rip Rap, Randy. Thanks again. Glad to be here. As That's usual, sorry, as <laughs> usual, a wide, <laughs> eclectic <laughs> variety hey, of things. we got another to stack of right. here. <laughs> but the one that I thought we'd start off, since we're videotaping this in the summer, is uh, a book by Colin Smith called This Cold House, and it deals with the, what he calls the simple science of energy efficiency, which also in the summer, gas prices are higher than they've ever been. Yep. And sometimes Thank it's skyrocketed up 50 cents within one weekend. And so this whole thing of taking a look at energy efficiency, what the costs are, are is of enormous importance. And um, the thing I liked about the book is he combines both anecdotes and examples in answering these questions about what you do with heating and cooling priorities. But it has huge social um, significance in just understanding what's going on. You know, I just got back from a month in Europe, and, and uh, I was struck by how how people have adapted, how basic energy awareness is so so much a part of just daily life, everybody's life in a, in a certain way. Um, and there's such a difference between the American perception and the European perception, you know, of basic personalities, the way people use water, for instance. But for instance, um, washing machines, small loads, they're uh, almost all set to be uh, to use efficient uh, water very efficiently. A small amount of water. Um, they typically do uh, small loads. They t people don't have big dryers, for instance, in general. Uh, people also have point of demand hot water heaters, so that they get the water as they need it. So they don't have to keep 80 gallons or 100 gallons always hot the way a typical house in America does. And uh, these systems are starting to take on, you know, in, in, in plumbing, uh, whatever, in, in the states, in basic, um, uh, it, we're changing in that way, but they're typically very, very expensive here, that kind of water system, for some reason. Well, uh, I thought it was fascinating when he talks about this cold house, also evokes memories of people who can't pay the energy bills when they come due because it comes down to, am I going to eat or am I going to put heat in the house? Yes, exactly. Yeah, right. I was talking with someone last night, and, and we were talking about diesel fuel prices are just off the map. Mm -hmm, very high. In fact, sometimes they're higher than regular car and gas. Yes, right. And, um, you know, it used to be diesel was dirt cheap, and you could buy it for 49 cents a gallon. Now it's 249 a gallon. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he was talking about how some of these semi-trucks have 300 gallons worth of gas that they buy for both tanks. So you're talking a thousand dollars take to fill up the gas. And he said, you, you know, that's, and it's starting to have an impact on all our food Everything, prices, right. petroleum products, um, and so we're having to make a lot of decisions. And people, they're, they're starting to see how people are shifting from SUVs or trying to dump them and get something else that's more efficient. Mm -hmm. But there's a fascinating thing that fuel oil prices and energy costs overall have the quickest impact on your personal and national economies, uh, and it's just huge. Um, so this whole thing of what's going on and how can you do it better is of enormous yeah. Know, concern. Yeah, uh, that's true. I think one, one thing that fascinates me is that we haven't thought about how we can produce energy more efficiently exactly. Um, some of the technologies we looked at in the past, which are starting to come back, are like nuclear power. But nuclear power plant is only good for 30 years. Mm -hmm. So people are starting to take a look at solar power. Um, you know, putting solar power windows in, um, wind, you know, turbines and stuff like that. Which, you know, I, I'm really in favor of that. But it's a very serious issue because we have a culture and a society that runs so much on, you know, all these devices. We have, we've also, in America anyway, have convinced ourselves that everybody, that we each need our own personal um, modes of transportation and as a, you know, the amount of energy we consume personally is just enormous compared, I, mean, I suppose there are other developed countries in the world where 
It, it might be similar to the America. Not I don't, quite I don't know America if we're quite version. the most wasteful country, but we, we all need a television. Are. We all need a computer. Right. We all need our own car. We've made this individualism such a such a cult that uh, public transportation is a perfect example of of how, in general, it's much. I'm sure it's much more efficient to run public transport than it is to you know, just have personal transport. Um, but the, the tragic so thing is that some people, the cost of obtaining the energy are so high that people yeah. are going to decide, do I buy medicine, do I eat? Right, exactly. Um, and what do I do? And it has an impact on, on uh, certainly on, on the economics. I mean, I'm talking about more or less the situation in, say, middle class houses. Com I'm comparing Europe and America. But if you look at the poor, and what um, what you know people who are poor have uh, have as options it's a it's a real crisis well and there were horse stories last winter people simply died that it got so cold at certain times that they yeah couldn't provide the heat or they would have fires from running the oven or uh, some other some kind, kind of right, kerosene right, right. Um, uh, some other uh, accident would happen so the policy aspect is what really seems to be yeah. critical in this, uh, in this, this next volume. book I thought you would be interested in the, the inclusive city infrastructure and public services for the urban poor in Asia edited edited by Aprodicio A. Laquian Vinod Tawari and Lisa M. Hanley put out by um, Johns Hopkins University Press the Woodrow Wilson Center Press as well Actually, the, the practicality of some of the infrastructure systems that were mentioned in the book um, uh, 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 caught my eye. Uh, apart from, obviously, this is about infrastructure and public services, public policy, but you think about all the things that are necessary to run a city, landfills, uh, there's a talk here about community toilets, water, how do you get, um, how do you get waste moved not not just human waste but food waste and you know move foods through through markets how do you do things like that and get food to people and get uh, clean water to people uh, it's 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 an enormous enormous issue so a lot of the they're talking about a lot of the sort of um, uh, community approaches to trying to get he healthy water for instance and uh, septic systems that are you know you have um, clean water, gray water, and then sewer. Uh, gray water being water that isn't completely, uh, not potable, but is used, can, can be used for cleaning, for instance, for washing or for uh, doing laundries or something like well, that. Well, it fascinated so me because the density of population in Asia has always fascinated yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's represented... It's denser than dense, isn't it? Yeah, some, really. Yeah. It's, yeah. I was talking from someone from India, one of my students, uh, in the last couple of weeks, and we, he comes, his family comes from India, and he had gone back there to visit. And, you know, it's just fascinating. There are buildings there that are sold, you know, and, and trying to live in that environment. And you can't if you're having construction go on then you can build new you know infrastructure you can build new toilets or you can adapt mm -hmm. the electric. but if you're you've got buildings that are so old you can't even get in them it's it's almost impossible you have to run wires and external you have oh, to run pipes right. and then yeah. you know to get to, to it, adapt to, update to it. yeah some and way. some of it's just totally prohibitive you right. just cannot and there's people living we would say on top of each other in other words there's such a density that that um it produ provide some really, you know, challenging problems about how you're going to deal with it. Right, to say the but least. I think it, it's also a, an interesting challenge. The other thing that uh, fascinates me about it is that the governments in that are underfunded. I mean, they're, they've got these huge issues they're trying to deal with, population control or shaping, well, you know, how you're dealing with all these people. Uh, is they're just uh, overwhelmed. I mean, simple problems turn into like the SARS disease with the mm -hmm. chickens. You know that it just overwhelmed mm -hmm. uh, the different cities where that occurred, um, where they're throwing out millions of chickens. I mean, just the, just the uh, trying to deal with a specific problem, much less than trying to shape general public right. policy. Right. Medical medical issues go. Medical problems spread so quickly, so fast. By the time you make something public, make the public aware of the issue, the the epidemiology of it is sort of, you know, 
gotten yeah. ahead of you. I remember going to Indonesia in the 70s. Uh, I was just looking through some of these titles. A lot of public transport, solid waste management, privatization of water services. These are the topics that are discussed in the book. But one thing on the, the chapter mentions landfill. Uh, landfill in the developed world, we're used to septic landfill, closed landfills, which can be um, maintained and uh, so they don't leak, basically. This is, this is not the case in landfill areas in many of the Asian cities, most, I guess. Uh, when I was in Indonesia in the 70s, plastic, in the sense of everything being in a plastic bag, had, was just sort of beginning to hit there. Um, typically things that were wrapped were wrapped in paper or wrapped actually in banana leaves and, and a lot of natural because the, the environment is just so, it's a tropical environment and there's leaf material everywhere which of course decomposes naturally. So the typical, um, the typical scene, even though people did have small fires to burn trash, they were burning uh, leaves. So uh, waste was uh, largely f uh, natural in a certain in a certain level, food products and whatnot uh, that you'd pick up in the street. But ten years later, every one of the food products that used to be wrapped in, say, banana or various types of uh, natural wrappings or paper, now universally was wrapped in plastic. But the pattern of burning still was there. It was very uh, typical to burn trash. But now you, what you're doing is burning plastic. We think in this country, we send it off to the trash, to the dump, a garbage... We don't see it. A right. garbage it's truck picks gone, it up. Right. You know, and there's an gone. infrastructure... But I read about Hong Kong, there's a whole population of people who live and work in the dump, where the, the, the rag, landfill, the where rag they bring all the... Yeah. And that it's so many of them that when a truck comes in, it really has to make room to come in to drop off the latest load. And those people go through, that's how they get their money, how they get their yeah. food. You know, this is a, a tragic case of human, uh, the uh, many, many people, thousands of people live around this dump. Mm -hmm. That's their livelihood. That's and right. they their, their homes are built out of, you know, cardboard and whatever wood they can find or whatever types of things. The thing that fascinated me was there was a line of continuity from so society included, the population mm -hmm. included, those sending off the trash and those picking mm -hmm. it up and reusing it. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's that kind of complexity that comes out of the density, the thing that I felt was important. Um, the next book is by Craig Mittman, uh, Breathing Space, How Allergies Shape Our Lives and Our Landscapes, and it's really helpful, I think, uh, because he says allergy is the sixth leading cause of chronic illness in the United States. More than 50 million Americans suffer from allergies, and they spend an eight estimated $18 billion coping with them. And it can be really critical. Right. I mean, someone has an allergic response, they can die, and, and quickly. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, uh, you know, giving usual CPR isn't going to help. Right. But so he's talking about life-threatening allergies, such as a bee sting. Well, no, he's, well, he's doing that, but he's talking something. about how it's so perva uh, pervasive right, that right. these triggers, th that first of all, that the, the, the allergic disease has shaped our American landscape mm -hmm. and culture and life. And then he's talking about, uh, and the impacts is on people, plants, and insects. Um, from the late 1800s to the present day, and that this is what's led to, to epidemic uh, uh, growth of allergic disease. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the it's on the increase. We yeah, haven't, we I think this stopped. is one of these nice pieces of scholarship that gives an overview. So, well, this is what's been right. going on overall with this. So, he, uh, it sounds like it's an environmental problem as well. Well, it's in the environment. Yeah, there's yeah. all kinds I mean of triggers. It, it you know, like uh, there's this thing he talks about. Uh, in terms of women using some makeup that has a highly allergenic natural ingredient derived from iris plants and, you know, uh, there's another, there's other ways of doing it, mm -hmm. but we too often use chemicals and all kinds of other things that just, yeah. people have, uh, you know, the latest thing is to use a lot of latex gloves and other things, uh, and people have allergies to latex, it's horrible. I mean, you know, they react right away. Right, skin reactions. Yeah, right. yeah they start in hives and yes, have an right. immunological right. reaction to it. So, and then you know, it has an impact on cities and the smoke that's available from like when people try the cities try to start up incinerators, get rid of trash. 
that produces uh, sure. there's all kinds of stuff After in that products, smoke. Whatever yeah, byproducts of that. plastic, right, it does right. stuff in the plastic itself. So we need an anaerobic burning uh, chamber. It's definitely uh, um, an issue that needs to be needs to be looked at, and especially the way that um, I guess culturally or sociologically, allergies have so much more effect on lifestyle life patterns how you where what you can actually do with your life hey, but you know the problem with chemicals and chemical so, allergies are you much know, more uh, with the concern about disease i've found cuz my lungs are bothered by chemicals yeah. that you know waitresses and restaurants go around spraying bleach everywhere yeah, yeah, and it's leaving right. claws to try to be them, you know try to be clean and if i have that i got to walk out cuz i'm in serious trouble well the other thing is that i think it we don't really maybe recognize how debilitating allergies over time can really be on our on our on our lives and have an effect medically throughout our lives. This next book is by Josh Swiller, A Memory of Deafness in Africa. And he is deaf, uh, but he had a, a cochlear implant and so he's recovered some hearing. But I thought and what had happened is that he's a journalist and a food chef and and has written about different topics on this, but um he talks about the impact of being deaf at a young age and then spending his formative years, um, you know, struggling with this and turning out and going to Zambia where he worked as a Peace Corps volunteer. But it, what I liked is that he evokes the sense of um, intercultural contact and then having some kind of way of difficulty in perceiving mm -hmm. what the other person is talking mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's difficult enough to have intercultural interaction. But when you have some perceptive or cognitive issue that makes it even right. more uh, profound mm -hmm. is that the fact that in an intercultural contact, you have to have all your, you know, it's very difficult to understand what the other person's talking about. It's not only what they're talking about, but to interpret the non-verbal. Right. Well, thing. metaphorically, it's right. very true. I mean, you, you literally, even though you're physically hearing, you're... You, culturally, you you can't hear. You're deaf when you right. go to a culture what for the you first perceive. time. Yeah, yeah. You, d you don't understand the 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 full impact of it from a from you know. Well, you've had intercultural experiences too, and you know how just a c one word can be misinterpreted by both sides. Oh, I mean, I, say something. I can give you a perfect example of uh, something that just happened in the past month. That, uh, in in my friend uh, who uh, who I you know spent some time with. Um, said to me, well, we here in Holland, are, we're, you know, bilingual, we speak English very well. I, and I was saying, you know, I, I, it's unfortunate, I really don't have to speak Dutch. He says, yeah, but you have to know Dutch a little bit because people are speaking English to you, but they're speaking it as Dutch people. So they're speaking Dutch to you using English words. And the example was that someone in the museum had said to me, I asked to see some uh, plates, uh, uh, some uh, registration cards that I was doing research on, and he said, "Oh, this could, this is a, this is going to be a problem." Now, if I when I hear that as an American, an English speaker, that means sorry, it's not happening. That's not going to happen. And I went home completely depressed. I mean, I so I was telling this to people, and after about a week, I realized that he was being extremely honest and saying. You know, this is going to be a, literally a problem. It doesn't mean we can't do it or that I can't show you. Right. And lo and behold, the next day when I went to see him, he said, well, okay, here's where all the registration cards are. If you want to take the trouble and go through and find what you need, be my guest. But basically he was saying, I can't do it for you, but here they are. And so I went, oh, hallelujah, you know, <laughs> fantastic. Now I understand. You just what wanted access. Right. You thought he was denying I access. I thought he was denying access because I heard it with my yeah. own cultural uh, prejudice, which is if somebody says that to me in America, it means, sorry, this is the roadblock. You have to work it, work it another way. You were interested in this next book. Now, the next one, uns first of all, anything that says unspun, I go, oh, yeah, this has got to be about, uh, you know, truth and uh, the, the, the real meaning behind things. Finding facts in a world of disinformation. Um, th this book is kind of a compendium of, of analyses of, of how messages, especially in advertising and media, are designed to, um, uh, to really say what is, what is, how do I say this? 
the message is about what the, me what, what the words are not. In other words, they'll say something is for consumer freedom. You know, the, society, the, the, the foundation for consumer freedom, which is really a lobby industry for alcohol and cigarettes. Um, or there are very many other examples. One of the classic Bush administration examples is the, clear, the Clean Air Act, which actually decreases the right. restrictions on, say, mercury in the, in the atmosphere and things like that. So this book is about unspinning truths. And one of the funniest, for instance, is the analysis of the, of the phrase, the tall coffee. For instance, if you go to Starbucks, you, you know, you got tall, grande and vente or whatever, you know, it's like, uh, s you know, small, medium, large, but they don't call it that. The small is actually called tall, and the whole chapter is about the word tall and why we can't just say, you know, you know, 12 ounce or whatever, uh, comparisons. And so it, it touches on traditional uh, tricks in advertising and um, uh, the way we use language to sort of deceive ourselves, I guess. The thing that, and it's a very good point, but the thing that bothers me is so many people actually believe it. You know, if it's written in there, it's like the Bible. You know, it's, it's a sacred text, and that's how it is. Yeah. Well, no. Someone had concocted it, a text to, you know, market some product or some idea, you know, just like when President Bush stepped on that aircraft carrier after flying in and declared, mission accomplished. Well, no, it wasn't. <laughs> I mean, it's all that stuff, and the spin has become more important now than the actual uh, quality and integrity and right. truth of the message itself. Right. And they talk about all these debates, and we're going into another presidential campaign, uh, and they'll have what they call the spin doctors, and yeah. they take this twist on it. It's always for their guy or their person um, you know, uh, to give the best possible interpretation of yeah. it. But yeah. after a while, you wonder if you're not really living in a whole world of disingenuous lies that d don't have little, if anything, to do with the actual, you know, the actuality. Yeah, the world has spin. It's uh, become, you know, the typical, it's the sort of the, the subtext to public life now. Who's, everybody's got an agenda. This is the postmodern framework. Everyone has an agenda. Everything is agenda, and you're basically putting, you know, your your issue forward, and you have to kind of interpret where, quote unquote, where somebody's coming from. It's well, what's uh, really scary is we have the the people who live off of the spin, you know, and I can't help talking about Paris Hilton in that way, uh, the the descendant of the Hilton, you know, uh, hotel chain, because. She's the queen of the spin. I mean, she wouldn't even exist except the the, the wonderful way that people are promoting well, her right. have been able to These ride this media, whole thing. Right. Everybody, uh, every every media puts forth a uh, a new phenomenon yeah. and can create can create a phenomenon within you know five days. You can create. It has nothing a to do with substance. Everything to do with with the spin. It has I to mean, do with be, right, exactly. Be this Kind of glass. It's an exoskeleton. There's That's really right. no substance in That's there. That's right. <laughs> it's like exo exo truth. <laughs> it's kind of like cotton candy or something. Exactly. It's wonderful to right. look at. It's right. kind of Just tasty, but what is it? What is it? You can't. You, you really can can't define it. And then in the mi in the meantime, in the middle of all this, there are dead serious, uh, you know, horrible things happening in the world that that really do affect people's lives and their their safety and their health. That we uh, that, that 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 gets perpetrated upon them. See, I I, you know, I was wondering as I was thinking about this book, I was just starting to wonder. Well, maybe there's a need as we're in this post-imperial phrase, uh, phase that we need something that doesn't deal with the actuality. We we need these these def distractions and deflections away from it. They have nothing to do with anything, but it's pleasant to be distracted. I don't know. Yeah, but. Uh, this is a book by Susan Landauer on Elmer Bischoff called The Ethics of Paint. And uh, I thought it was interesting because he was one of the leaders of the San Francisco group um, and contributed to the emergence of abstract expressionism there in the 1940s and the 50s. Mm -hmm. So kind of revisiting this, and this is not one of these books that it's a Murphy Fine Arts book, but it's just a wonderful retrospective, and it has some great illustrations of uh, acrylic, chalk, uh, you know, it's kind of going back there, and I like the, the phrase that they use here about looking at visual intelligence, you know, that 
he had this wonderful way of interpreting, not mm -hmm. a literalistic kind of thing. But well, maybe that's where the term ethics comes in. I love the title, Ethics of Paint. If you yeah. think about that, it, it just sort of turned my head a little bit. But what is the ethics of paint? And sh she talks briefly about the difference between uh, the, the portraiture, I guess uh, the capturing of, of someone in a painting that's recognizable, perhaps that's, that might be too crass for an art historian, but I'll use the term right. recognizable versus abstract expressionism, uh, uh, which can be anywhere from, uh, from the recognizable subject to, you know, a, a very, uh, uh, expre to use, to be redundant, ex expressionist in paint and not necessarily a, a literal subject at all. Um, but I felt the ethics of, of this kind of abstract expressionism Expressionism was more following the painting interest, the requirements of the art. What is interesting of the person or the the landscape mm. or the event, and following that out in terms of color and mm -hmm. shape and mm -hmm. what you're doing, and that may need to to reshape it even in order to look at the thing right. where the energy is in that moment rather right. than, oh, well, of course I have to have a face like this and a shape it like looks this a and clothing way. dresses, you know, the person dressed right. a certain way for everyone to be pleased with it. Because one of the biggest scandals at the time of the Impressionists was that they were not painting reality. Yeah. And what they were saying is they're, you know, ultimately, how many realities are there? You know, there's light on objects but that changes so many uh, at any well, wasn't moment. Wasn't a factor in that was the French school, the the um, gallery or the, the society that enforced the rules and that they would be admitted to the oh academy. the salon the yeah. academy right they the academy, they reacted they enforce those rules. I mean there was right. an issue about language. There was an issue about art. Yeah, that would see that does get to an ethics of paint. I mean yeah. they even something as uh, as basic as deciding to paint on a white canvas or on white as opposed to starting out with black and painting on top of black. I mean that was a real uh, when there was switch. stories about Many, how I mean, horrified they were. How dare you violate right, the most right. because so they looked at painting in a way of you know all about hanging it in the galleries and you know, who was going to represent painting or a whole change the history if you dare paint right. like that. What this book shows is the strength uh, it's really nice to the strength of this West Coast American tradition in in, uh, in in you know late 20th century painting it's very strong and and uh, uh, cap it captures this book captures that in terms of comparison as well with other but then how it would painters. flow through uh, you know into the universities and then into the galleries there was a whole uh, culture uh, that was sustaining defining and practicing it I find mm -hmm. that fascinating. Mm -hmm. Thanks. We had another session on Rip Rap. Yeah, Thank great. You for doing I'm it. glad I came, and uh, it certainly was eclectic as usual. Thanks again. Okay. Thank you.